Today we will be continuing with our sermon series on the parables. Today's sermon is titled, Be Prepared. Some people like to prepare, like to plan ahead, to always feel like they know what's going to happen. Some people like to plan out their day, plan out their week. Some people even plan out their whole month. You might be one of those people that when you go on a vacation, you start packing your suitcase a week ahead of time. Are there some people like that? Some people are just natural planners. Some people, though, are, are on the opposite end of the spectrum. They like spontaneity. They like to do things at the last moment. They like the excitement of figuring things out as they go. Some of you might be that way. Or you might be kind of like me, that you're kind of in between, and it depends on the situation. When we go on vacation, we tend to go to the same couple of spots. We'll camp at, at you know, a couple campsites, and we don't usually do anything too radically different. Or we'll go to the Oregon coast, and we, you know, we stay at the same spot. Um, okay, we lost some lights there. <laughs> um, and so there's not a lot of preparation that's needed for that, right? I mean, I'll, I'll pack my suitcase the morning we leave sometimes because I know what to expect. If we go to the Oregon coast, I know I pretty much have to plan for sun, wind, and rain because I might get all three of those in one day. But you know what to expect. However, our family is getting ready to go on a, on a longer road trip. We're going go to go through three states outside the state of Washington. We're going to visit three national parks. And so there's been some preparation, some planning that's been needed. I've heard about some great sites to see. And so we checked out a couple books at the library. We, I've been looking at some maps online. And of course, some of these places, you have to make reservations months in advance or else you won't have a place to stay. Whether you're a natural planner, a natural, natural at, at being prepared and planning, I think all of us recognize there are some things where it's important to plan, to prepare, to make sure you're ready. And that's what we'll be discussing today. Today, we will talk about being prepared, being ready, and what it, li- what it means to live in a state of readiness. And for this topic today, Jesus warns us that a lack of readiness, a lack of preparedness, results in devastating and eternal consequences. Today we will be covering Matthew chapter 25 and verses 1 through 13 and we have two fine gentlemen here that will be happy to loan or give you a Bible. If you don't don't have one, just raise your hand, let them know. All right. There we go, lights back on. (laughs) All right, so let's let's look at the at the passage we're covering today. Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew 25, 1 through 13. We should also have it up here on the, on the projector. Okay, so Matthew 25 and starting in verse 1. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. As I studied some resources in preparation for this sermon, I found there's a little bit of controversy about this parable. There are those who make it very complicated, who try to find hidden meanings in every detail of this parable. There are those who wonder why certain things are missing, 
Did Jesus mean something by some of these things not being there? For example, why is there no bride mentioned? <laughs> why was the bridegroom delayed? Why did he come at midnight? Curiosity can certainly be a good thing. If it prompts us to further study, read God's word, pray, investigate for ourselves, see what his word says. But we should not get caught up in trying to find hidden meanings in this or, or any of the parables. When Jason introduced the sermon series on the parables back in, I think that was about the first of June, he told us that these are not fables, myths, or allegories. Jesus is not trying to embed a bunch of hidden details in these parables. Instead, Jason reminded us that Jesus was trying to communicate the message of the gospel in such a way that those who were seeking to understand the truth would understand. The parable really is simple. There are four main parts that we will cover today. We have the wedding ceremony. We have the virgins who are bridesmaids. We have the bridegroom and then we have the warning that comes at the end. First, I think it's important to understand a little bit about Jewish marriages. that gives us a little background to what Jesus is describing here. There are some things in this description of this event that seem a little unusual to us of how we do marriages and weddings. <clears throat> in traditional Jewish marriages there typically were three phases. We had the engagement which was really an agreement between fathers. Typically the father of a, a young man would approach the father of a young lady they would discuss this potential engagement and if they came to an arrangement, an agreement, then the young couple would be engaged. It really was an arrangement between fathers. Next came the betrothal and the betrothal was very formal. The betrothal was in many ways much like a wedding. There would be an official ceremony. The young couple would exchange vows there would be a legally binding agreement between them, joining them. It would almost be as if they were married now. In fact, to end a betrothal would require a certificate of divorce. And if the young man died during the betrothal, the young lady would be considered a widow. However, during the betrothal, they would not be allowed to physically consummate the marriage. They did not live yet together yet, and it would be considered sinful for them to have sexual relations at this point. We know a little bit about this from a very well-known story in the Bible. As you may recall from Matthew chapter 1, in the story of Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph were betrothed to each other. When it was first discovered that Mary was found to be with child, Joseph planned to divorce her quietly. Quietly because he was a good, kind man. He did not want to subject her to, to public disgrace, but divorce her because he knew this was not his child. And they did, not deliver, they did not live together yet. Also in traditional Jewish marriages, it's important to know that during the betrothal, the young man would be working. He'd be working to get things ready. He might build a house. He might plant and harvest a field. He was supposed to be getting ready for, to bring a wife and a family home. He had to, to prove that he could support a wife and a family. I think some of the Fathers of daughters right now are thinking, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good system. <laughs> and in many ways it was. He had to prove himself to be responsible. When he had sufficiently prepared, the wedding ceremony would be announced. The groom, along with, with a few friends, maybe several friends, would proceed to the home of the bride. When they would arrive, there would be a procession through town usually at night. These were typically nighttime affairs. There'd be this procession with these oil-burning lamps that we hear about in the parable. And in smaller towns especially, the whole town might get involved. This was a huge event. It was a big celebration. The bride would be waiting with her bridesmaids, waiting for her groom to arrive. Imagine the anticipation leading up to this ceremony. All the preparation, all the planning, all the waiting. Now finally the wedding celebration has arrived. 
And that's where we're at here in this parable. This is what, what Jesus is describing. It's important to understand the biblical context in which Jesus is speaking. Notice in verse 1, it starts out that then the kingdom of heaven will be like. So he says the kingdom of heaven, but what does he mean by that? Notice the first word is then. Then can mean at that time or soon afterward. Sometimes it's used in place of the word therefore or for this reason. It indicates that something previously has been discussed and now we're continuing with that, that thought or furthering that thought. So it's important to know what was discussed in the previous chapter, in chapter 24. If you would please turn back a page or two in your Bibles. We will look at Matthew 24, verse 3. And in verse 3 it says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Sign of your coming and the end of the age. Then throughout the rest of chapter 24, Jesus goes on to describe the signs of his second coming. And here we have chapter 25 with Jesus continuing to tell us about his return. Next, let's look at the bridesmaids called virgins here. We have ten virgins. Other than the bridegroom himself, these are the main characters of the story. There seems to be nothing particularly special about them being called virgins. It doesn't necessarily indicate purity. For the wedding ceremony in that culture, the bridesmaids would have been young females, typically younger relatives or young, much younger friends of the bride. It was just assumed that they would be virgins. The number 10 is not necessarily significant either. 10 was used a little bit in, in Jewish culture. For example, it took a minimum of 10 men to constitute a synagogue. Ten is used in other settings. Ten likely was just an average number for a wedding party. Jesus, however, tells us what's significant. Let's look at verse 2 again. Verses 2 through 4. He tells us, Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. So Jesus tells us that half of these virgins are wise and half are foolish. He's not insulting them. He's not saying they were uneducated. He's not even saying they, in general, lack a common sense. It was their lack of preparedness. It was their carelessness for which he calls them foolish. They arrived at a place where they knew what they were supposed to be doing, what they, they knew what they needed, yet they failed to prepare. These lamps, as they're called, were really more like torches. They worked by a, a cloth. Some cloth would burn. It would be soaked in oil. The flasks would have been used, of course, to fill these lamps or these torches with the necessary oil. Without the, without the oil, the cloth might have smoldered for a little while, but the lamp would not function in any way as a, as a real functioning torch. So it was their carelessness for which they're called foolish. Next, let's look at the bridegroom. It tells us about a little bit about the bridegroom here in verses 5 and 6. It says, As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. So we know that our bridegroom was delayed. We know it's the bridegroom that everyone is waiting for. We know when we read verse 12 at the beginning that it was the bridegroom who ultimately decided who was allowed to enter the wedding ceremony. It was the bride that said, I do not know you, to those that were not allowed to enter. But in case you still have any doubts of who the bridegroom is, or if you're just like me and you like to see how lots of different parts of Scripture, really how it all ties together, there are a couple references where Jesus clearly is referred to as a bridegroom. Matthew 9, 14 and 15 says, Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? You may or may not know that John the Baptist had some disciples for a time. 
So they're coming to Jesus to ask about this. And Jesus says to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom and noted that he would be taken away. And one more here on that topic, Revelation 19, 6 and 7. <clears throat> says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Jesus is that Lamb in this parable. Revelation is talking about the Lamb Jesus being reunited with his church. Notice in verse 5, it told us that the bridegroom was delayed. Does it ever feel like Jesus is delayed and returning? Do you ever wonder why Jesus is taking so long to come back? Do you ever doubt that Jesus is coming back? We have a lot of naysayers in our society. We even have people who claim to be Christians yet who don't hold on to the traditional views of Jesus' return. We know that God always does what he says he will do. Jesus told us very clearly he will return. It's in our parable. There are many passages. John 14, 2 and 3 says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself and where I am you also may be. We talked about Matthew 24. Verse 27 says, For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 30 says, They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. So Jesus tells us and warns us over and over and over again that he's coming back and not to be unprepared. If you were to study further in chapter 24, Jesus even goes on to describe how when he returns, it will be as in the days of Noah, where people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, and sadly, many were unprepared and were swept away. And so will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus warns us. It feels like the bridegroom's delayed. But please note, the first time Jesus came to this earth as a baby in Bethlehem, it had been foretold for thousands of years that he would come. Bible scholars tell us that Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies with his birth, life, death, and resurrection. Why would we not believe he's coming again as he said he would? Let's get back to our parable here. Verses 7 through 12. Let's look at those a little closer here. It says in verse 7, Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. The five foolish bridesmaids found themselves unprepared at the time when it was too late. They tried to go get the oil at the last minute. They wanted to be a part of the wedding celebration. Jesus is making it clear that there is a time to come to him, to confess your sins, to decide to follow him, seek a relationship with him. He's available 24-7, 365. He's never asleep. He's never too busy. He's available. But there is a time when it's too late 
He warns us and warns us and warns us. He ends the parable at verse 12, but he takes the time in verse 23 to warn us again. Verse 13 warns us, Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. When Jesus says to watch, he means to be ready, to be prepared, to live in a state of readiness. We must ask ourselves, what does it mean to be ready? The five foolish bridesmaids did not have a relationship with Jesus. The bridegroom says, I do not know you. What does it take to come to know Jesus? Is he hard to get to know? Many scriptures tell us how to come to know Jesus. Many scriptures tell us what it takes to be saved. A well-known one is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Ephesians 1.13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed, you were sealed with the promise of Holy Spirit. We can make the gospel so complicated, but yet it really is so simple. All we have to do is believe. Believe that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. If you haven't done that yet, if you haven't made that decision yet, if you, if you don't know Jesus, please consider whether today is the day. If you have questions, find an elder, find a pastor, find a trusted Christian friend. Open up your Bible. See what it says. Pray and ask Jesus to reveal himself to you. For those of us who are saved, who have that relationship... What are we supposed to be doing as we await the return of the bridegroom? I think it's interesting in our parable, the bridesmaids fell asleep. Notice that falling asleep was not criticized. The five wise bridesmaids fell asleep along with the five foolish. The bridegroom had been delayed till midnight. For most of us, maybe not all of us, it's normal to fall asleep before midnight. That was normal behavior for most of us. It's saying that it's, we should get on with normal life. We should marry. We should have kids if that's what God's plan for us. We should go to school, have careers, have jobs. We should be living life, living a normal life. It's not saying we're supposed to quit our jobs, quit everything else, go up on some hill somewhere and just look up waiting for Jesus to come back. No. We're supposed to get on with life. Jesus tells us, God's word tells us what we're supposed to be doing. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's prepared good works for us to do. That's not what gives us the oil. That doesn't give us salvation, but... The good works are what we're supposed to be doing for those who know Jesus to point others to him and to and because he chooses to accomplish his plan through us. Jesus' last words to his disciples are recorded in Matthew 28, 19 and 20 and he says here to go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Making disciples. Spreading his word, his name. Doing those good works he's planned for us to do. Telling others that he is coming back. I have to point out here that Within the warning, there's sort of another warning. And that pertains to the five foolish virgins or bridesmaids. They thought they were part of the group. They were waiting for the bridegroom to come. They were watching. They were right there. 
They had their lamps. They were probably dressed the same. They knew he was coming. Yet they didn't have the oil. They didn't know Jesus. It's clear that this parable is telling us that there are those who profess to be Christians that don't know the Lord. They don't know Jesus yet. Sadly, some will be caught surprised. Again, we don't want to read too much into the numbers. We don't want to assume too much. I do think it's interesting that there were five virgins that were unprepared. There wasn't one. Why didn't Jesus say one? I don't think that means that half of us or half of the people sitting in churches today are not saved. I don't want to assume that. But it does seem to indicate that there's a significant number. These might be people who think they're okay because they go to church or because they grew up in a Christian home or they belong to a small group or they know parts of the Bible or they love to pay attention to certain parts of Scripture that they like that sounds good to them but ignore other parts. You know, let's talk about God's love but let's not talk about God's wrath. So we're called to examine ourselves. Examine your heart. And for those who are saved, we should be aware that even here on Sundays, every Sunday, there are quite a number who don't know Jesus, who need to hear the gospel from our very lips, from our mouth, as we talk to them, interact with them. This story doesn't fit well in our culture, does it? Our culture wants to be inclusive. Our culture wants to think that everyone's going to be okay and just having some sort of faith is all you need. Jesus makes it very clear that's not true. Sadly, many will find themselves unaware and unprepared. Have you ever waited for something so long that you finally got to the point where you just didn't care anymore? Apathy can kind of set in, can't it, when you wait long enough for something? So how do we, as those who are saved, stay passionate, stay vigilant? How do we avoid apathy? How do we stay excited? How do we keep that sense of anticipation that the young couple would have felt when they finally got to that wedding celebration and all that planning and preparation and all that had happened and they were finally going to be married? How do we keep that, that sense of anticipation? I don't know about you, but for me, it takes a lot of reminding. A lot of reminding of what Jesus has done for me, how dead I was in my sins before he saved me. It takes a lot of prayer, a lot of Bible study, a lot of meditation. Growing in a deeper relationship with Jesus only happens with time spent. It's a relationship that grows deeper and grows better with time spent together. Last week, Keith reminded us that we have a Father who loves us desperately. A Father who loves us in spite of our sins. A Father who loves, would love to have reconciliation with us if we just would come to Him with a humble and contrite heart. I think every time we remember how dead we were in our sins, and what Jesus did to save us, to free us, that should spark feelings of excitement, Joyful anticipation as we await the return of the bridegroom. I want to leave you with a passage from Isaiah that reminds us of what Jesus did, and it was foretold many years before he came to this earth. Isaiah 53 5 tells us, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us and for that sacrifice that you paid for our sins. Lord, if those, there are those who don't know you today, Lord, I pray that you will call them and that you will reach them and that they will 
will seek you and they will make that decision today to come to know you. For those of us who know you, Lord, I pray that we will do your work, that we will stay passionate, stay excited, going on with life, but watching in joyful anticipation for your return. All this I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.